Okay, here we are back for lecture number three on how to preach. For those who maybe just be joining us, <clears throat> this is SP205. It's in the Department of Communications. If you go into our catalog, which is online, and get a course description, I am teaching in this course how to preach and how to prepare sermons for preaching. Uh, I'm giving you general styles that have been practiced throughout the century successfully. You ultimately, of course, develop your own style. The last lecture, I covered chapters 3 and 4, and I went on into chapter 5 because I wanted to repeat chapter 5 because one of the things I told you was that repetition is the key to learning. Repetition is the key to learning. So I want to go back, and I want you to get some of the uh, information that will affect you and will help you in understanding God's Word. Now, we're going to be learning how to prepare different sermons. But also we're going to be learning how to use ourselves in preaching. We talked about how you don't want to be a stiff preacher. You don't want to stand there and read your sermon. You want your body to yield itself to the message you're telling. If you're talking about somebody running, you know, you see the man who did this, or he got him another that, or she bent down, you know, or she got down on her knees. You know, you're expressing visually some of what you're preaching. Because some people are more visual uh, than they are in listening. And so it helps those people, you know, the word becomes more real to them when you're able to express it. I had you last week to work on a scripture. And uh, for those who are actually taking it here on campus, you will have to do that when you come back at the end of the semester with your sermons prepared, uh, in which you have one or two verses and you act it out. Just to, not that you would do it that way in a sermon, but that by practicing that, it makes you realize that preaching doesn't have to be like this. That you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And there's nothing irreverent in, in doing that. There's nothing uh, you know, disrespectful in making the Word come alive because it's alive inside of you. And it just makes, it finds its expression. It can't help it when it expresses itself. Now, uh, I also encourage, uh, for the purpose of preaching, the use of the New King James Version. Uh, I know that a lot of people, the NIV is very popular today. I love the NIV, but the, 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 the expressions and the, uh, some of the passages in the NIV, I'm really not very happy with. In fact, it's good sometimes to maybe uh, get one of these um, brochures. I, I know Rose Publishing, and I think they've been bought out by somebody else, but you can probably find them online and, and track them down. They have these neat little folded uh, brochures, but they're, they're, you know, they're really nice and they're good size, and they have it on every subject. And one is the different translations of the Bible. How do they differ? And you find out that some translations were translated word for word, and some tried to give the expression of what they meant, and some used this particular, they lean towards these ancient documents, and the other one leans towards these ancient documents, and there's a lot of diversity, and that's why we have so many translations, because it's all how you uh, look at it. And that's also why, in spite of all of these translations, still today, the most popular translation in the world is the King James Version. And, uh, and the New King James Version takes out the archaic words because words and their meanings do change over a period of time. And so it takes out the archaic words, but it keeps the general uh, expression. The, the King James Version of the Bible is some of the most beautifully expressed words in English that have ever been written. This is what makes Shakespeare famous. Shakespeare really gave the English language uh, uh, vocabulary, but also visual understanding. And, and, and the works of Shakespeare, that's why they're so important. You know, today we think anything from back anywhere is not important. St students don't learn how to write cursive. They don't learn how to, they don't know about Shakespeare, except he's some guy who lived a long time ago. They don't know the great authors. They, they don't know the great uh, writers in our own uh, history, especially some of those back in the 1700s, 1800s that wrote novels, and when well, all of them were historical type novels, and all they don't know any of that. It's like everything is the here and now. But understand something people who don't know the past tend to make the same mistakes that were made in the past. It's only by knowing the past. That's why I'm one that's very much opposed. Uh, to tearing down every single monument because it offends this one, that one, or the other. Now, if it was a monument 
that defended uh, the killing of 200 people by cutting their heads off. I mean, that's, you know, that, does, that doesn't tell us anything. We, we can know that with a, just a siren up there. But we need to be careful about tearing down the past because the past reminds us of the wrong that was done, all the different viewpoints that people had. And if you don't discuss those things, somebody in the future may get that same viewpoint again. And you don't have anything to relate to it because you threw away everything that had anything to associate with it. So it's important to know the past and to study the past. And, uh, but in doing so, always judge the past against the Word of God. I don't care how holy that person seemed to be, it's the Word of God that says yea and amen. It's not what people think or how special this person was in history or whatever else. I respect all these people who had good things in history and they did good things, but I do not respect some of the things they did. And it's okay not to respect some of the things they did. But you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You look at the whole, uh, whole picture in the situation. Now, uh, in this lecture, I'm going to have you prepare a topical sermon. And if you look at my, my book, which uh, this is the pre-Amazon version of my book, uh, you will look in chapter 6, and you will see uh, the, some of the aspects of preparing a topical sermon. A topical sermon is when you have a topic on your heart. You know, like you, you know, you're even thinking, no, I just wish I could feel peace. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a study on peace and see what God has to say. Maybe other people don't feel at peace in their heart. Or maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's prosperity, worship, salvation, joy, wisdom, heaven, hell, salvation, the righteousness of God. Uh, you find the, the topic that's on your heart and you feel like this would help people because it's helping you. Always make sure that your sermon starts in your heart because if it's not real to you, it's not going to be able to make it real to the people. A sermon is starting in your heart, your heart. And there are hundreds of topics that you can choose from. I've given some of the examples here. Now, with the topic, you begin to seek what is it I want to, you know, what, first of all, you look up some verses on that topic and go to a good concordance. Um, maybe if there's a, a Bible story that comes to mind about that topic, you might grasp that. Let's say you're talking about peace. And you want to bring out the fact that um, God understands we need peace sometimes. That's why, they, uh, that's why that he uh, sends angels to say, be not afraid. How many times in the Bible did an angel show up and say, be not afraid? Because he knows people get afraid. He knows their peace is disturbed. And so there's all kinds of things. But then also in the process of putting this together and seeking the Lord, you want to get a title. Now, you know, you say, well, why can't I just preach on heaven? Well, you can just preach on heaven, but why not heaven, a place I'm looking forward to being, or heaven, a place I'm looking forward to, or, or heaven, our future home. And why not make it a little more interesting to the people? Again, you want the Word to come alive. You know, you just want to give facts. You want them to understand the facts. You want them to understand what a great place that heaven is. And you want them to understand that we're not going to be floating around in the cl cl uh, clouds. That heaven is actually an actual place. It's not a, just another dimension. It's an actual place. Uh, the Bible says it's on the, God's throne was on the sides of the north, meaning that in the northern part of the, uh, of the solar system and of the uh, um, Milky Way galaxy, or even beyond that, somewhere there is a planet or a place called heaven, and his throne is there. And so, you know, you, you begin to make it real to people. A lot of times, so many things about the future and about heaven and hell and all are like, you know, like a vapor kind of a thing. It's like, okay, it's like a comic book or, you know, a cartoon. They don't really get the reality of it. You know, nothing can die in heaven. You can pick a rose and lay it there on the wall and it'll still be living a thousand years from now because nothing can die in heaven. I mean, you know, just you begin to think of the reality of this, this place called heaven and this dimension that we'll be in and, and we'll have glorified bodies and we will be moved not by propulsion, but by thought. You know, I think I'd like to take a look at that galaxy uh, about, you know, 20 hundred light years away and, you know, it's thought. You move by thought. 
And so, you know, it's really the reality of the things of God is what a lot of people have lost, and that's why they've lost their faith in the things of the Lord. Now, I encourage people not to have a lot of points. There's nothing worse than standing up and saying, uh, today I got a 10-point message. <laughs> they go, oh my God. And you know what they start doing? They start counting down those points. <laughs> After about 30 or 40 minutes, they say, oh my God, he's only on point three. <laughs> you know? no, yeah. It's okay to have a 10-point message, but let, don't, don't, not, maybe not necessarily unless you title it 10 points of becoming a man of God that, uh, you know, he said, don't be afraid. I'll be out of here in 30 minutes or I'll be out of here in three hours, whatever. You know, get a laugh out of them. But understand that you need to have an outline. Now, you may never say point one or point two. You know, I, a lot of times when I preach because I teach taught that way and I, I mean, I teach that way and I practice that. I will a lot of times say, now the second point is this, or the third point is this. Sometimes people say the second thing, or the second truth, or the second thought, or the second verse on this, or whatever. You know, uh, I just do it the old, you know, what I call old-fashioned. I say, okay, the third point is, and I do it that way. Uh, but you will develop your own way. But for the purpose of this class, I want you to have points. And here's what I want your sermon to look like. You ready? Get a sheet of paper. At the top, I want a title. I want a title. Below the title, I want a key verse. Whatever you're preaching on the subject matter, share a key verse with the congregation that talks about that subject matter. Then I want, after that, an introduction. Now, an introduction may be two or three sentences that you write out and you pretty much memorize, so you want to look down at your notes. Or it may just be two or three points that you are part of your introduction. Now, the reason I'm sharing this message today, or this message, and the reason I give an introduction is you get them prepared on where you want to go to. If you have a general title, they don't, they don't, you know, they're like, what, you know, where, where are we going to, what's this all? But if you give them an introduction, it's your chance to sort of capsulize what you're going to be leading them into. Okay? Introduction. Next, I want points. Point number one. Now, you can either give the name of the point or you can give the scripture. I usually give the name of the point, but sometimes I do it the other way too. But you might say the first point is um, praise uh, secures God's manifest presence. Notice the example here on page 17, presenting a topical sermon. Notice that my first point, see, first I had a title, uh, praise that brings a breakthrough. Then I have an opening scripture, 2 Chronicles 5, 13 through 14. Then I have an introduction. Then I have a first point. Praise secures God's manifest presence. And then I go back into that scripture I read up there to start with, and I bring out some thoughts in that, and I have some extra thoughts that I add to it. Now, the best preaching is when your sermon is outlined. Okay? Uh, if you want your sermons made into books, have somebody take the video and have them uh, take it and type it out into a you know, book form. But if you write a word-to-word -word sermon, it's going to look like that you're leaning on a manuscript instead of the Holy Spirit. The other thing I do when I write my sermons is I have big writing, especially if you're just starting. Why? Because you don't want to be tied to that note. You want to be over here talking and you go back and it gets your attention at point number two because it's about, you know, that big. It's about a half an inch or more big, point number two. And you got it printed out nice and big. In fact, in the early days of my sermons, and I usually require my students to do this, I say every point I want you to shadow or circle or whatever in blue and every scripture in red. So while you're getting into your sermon and you're getting back to where you were, immediately you know if it's blue, it's a point, it's red, it's a scripture. And you get right back to where you are. Because you don't want to sit there and look at that out. And uh, let's see, now, and now, now, now my, third, my third point is, no, you don't want to do that. You, want, you don't even want it to look like you're looking at your notes. You want to you know, just sort of look down occasionally and you see it there and you keep on and you, you go, and now the next one, you know, just... Of course, now, now my son has an advantage and many other ministers today that I didn't have all my years of preaching. And that is today, uh, first of all, I didn't have anything where people could see. 
until about 25 or 30 years ago when they started with the uh, old um, projector where you project it up on the, you know, uh, and then they've got now where you do it through a projector where it comes from the computer and all of that. And now a lot of preachers have their sermon outline on the wall at the back of the church on some kind of big screen and all they got to do is sort of look up and second and catch the next point and, and keep on preaching. And that's really great because it keeps you from, you know, remember, the Holy Spirit is described like a river, like water, uh, fountains of, uh, it is a, a cool water. A water doesn't stop and start unless you turn the faucet off. And if you have to turn the faucet off to turn it back on, that breaks the flow of the water. And you have to come back and look up. Let's see now. Okay. Uh, uh, all right now. Yeah, okay. We're at point number four. If you have to do that every point, you're, you're killing the flow of the Holy Spirit. You want to be under the anointing. And that's something that today is not being taught. Okay? So let me just go ahead and bring that out real strong. They're not taught to be under the anointing. Let me Listen to me. I have never but two times in my life not known what I was supposed to preach when I got into a pulpit. Never. I could not preach if I did not know that this is the only message I could preach on the month of March and the second Sunday at this time, in this place, at this hour. I couldn't preach. Amen. I couldn't. When I get up there to preach, I know that this is God's Word Amen. for this group of people of this day, this hour, this time. I may preach that same sermon again somewhere in another country, another place, but only because I know that's the message they need to hear. This is the one they need to hear. You see what I'm saying? I don't prepare messages just to preach because you're supposed to have a Sunday sermon. I've never done that my whole life. Two times I've had two messages, and I've sat there, and one or two times the Lord showed me which one at the last moment, and the other time it wasn't either one. I hadn't got when I stood up, all of a sudden I knew what I was supposed to preach on. And so I didn't have any notes, but I just preached from my heart, and I, the things that came to me I gave out. But I always know this is the only thing I could say today that would have the anointing. It would have the anointing. And I want to tell you, the anointing is powerful. You, you, if you look at my Facebook page and I share the story, when I was one of the experiences I had in Pakistan, I was preaching in a tent. And there was hundreds of people in the tent. Well, you know, in Pakistan, they have guard line, uh, guards for me when I preach. And so because of that particular area being an area that sometimes they had uh, terrorists, they gave me about 12, I've got maybe 12 guards with their little, you know, guns. But they were plainclothesmen guards, and they were hired by the local Christians to protect them. So when I got to the place, there were so many people that I had to park down the street. It was dirt streets, and they gathered around me. We walked through the crowd, and the guards were there protecting me. And we got into the tent, got into the service. I preached the service. When I got through preaching the service, I began to pray for people. People were falling under the power. God was moving. Things were happening. And finally, I got to a point I just couldn't pray no more. And uh, I, my, one of my, 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 my graduate name was on the other side of the tent praying for people the same way. And I told my interpreter, I said, send somebody and tell them Dr. Miller's going out in the cool air for a minute. He needs to rest. He may come back in. He may not. And so uh, he, they went over. So me and my interpreter, we walked outside. And I got out in the dark, and I looked. And there's soldiers lined up with their guns in their soldier outfit. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I, I asked the what's wrong? He said, I'll find out. So the one of the soldiers came over and started talking. I said, what's wrong? He said, they kept talking. So what's wrong? I said, just wait. So finally got through and the guy went back, you know, stood there with his gun. And my interpreter says, Dr. Miller, he said, they heard there was crowds over here and they was afraid there was trouble. So the soldiers were sent. But when they got here, they didn't see any trouble, so they slipped in the back of the tent. And they have seen and felt what God was doing. He says, they're all Muslims. They want you to pray for them. And I looked over at the captain, and he did like this. 
And here I was walking down that street one after another. All these Muslims said, Father, in the name of Jesus, reveal yourself to him, Lord. Let him learn about Jesus. Lord, if you have to come to him in a vision, God, I claim this man. I claim this household for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for the power of God that brings the salvation, truth to Jew and Gentile. And I pray over every one of them. And when I got down to the end of the street, and I don't do all that group, my security guards all lined up. And they didn't like that. <laughs> so I said, okay. And I went down there. And I went back up the street to the other end of the street. Why? Because I'm a great preacher? They heard the message being interpreted, but even that didn't do it. They felt something, and they saw people being healed. And that's why they knew this man is from God. I want him to pray for me. We have, we, we've lost that. We've lost, I don't see that anointing desire for that anointing. You know, that, that, that. but when I get up to preach, every time I do, it's like, Lord, just give it to me. Just let me, come on, Lord, I can't do it without you. Give, give me the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me just see the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, just, just anoint me, Lord, anoint me. And I can feel him when he comes into the service. And when he comes in, I'm ready to preach. I'm ready to go to it. The Word said, and people respond. And when I left the last time in um, Pakistan, my last, my third visit last time, the last thing they did was hold a healing service. They came by motorcycles. They came by cars. They came in buses. There were half a dozen or more buses lined up. They walked as far as the eye could see. They had an area that they had I put up curtains to try to hold in about a thousand or two or three. They filled up the outside. They got up on the rooftops all around. And I preached, and then I started praying for the sick, and they started seeing people who couldn't hardly walk. All of a sudden, they're walking, and they begin to see it, and they rushed the platform, and they were coming towards me, and the minister was trying to hold them off as I was praying. They all wanted to be prayed for, and the platform was as long as this room, and I went all the way down to the end, and finally I said, call the security guards. The security guards came, they locked arms, they held back the crowd, and then my helpers would bring one at a time out of the crowd for me to pray. That is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Do you want the anointing? Do you want to feel God? Do you want to see God move? Do you want to see the miracles of God? The book of Acts is our reality of the church. Okay? Now, I want to see points. Under each point, you can make a few comments about how you're going to do that. to help you. Okay, you're not going to write down everything. And then when you get to the end, you have a conclusion. Put conclusion. You tie it all up. And then you have an altar call. I'm a firm believer in altar calls. A chance for people to respond to the word they heard. If you preach on unforgiveness, have an altar call to get rid of unforgiveness. If you preach on pride, have an altar call to get rid of pride. If you preach on finances, have an altar call for tithers. You know, whatever it is, you, you know, you, you, they want to respond to the word. They need to respond to the word. Okay? All right. Next session, we will move to another type of, type of sermon, okay? All right.